Grace and peace. This is Apostle Cheryl L. Richardson. And I'd like to welcome you to another Shatter the Silence broadcast. Uh, we are committed to addressing the topic of domestic violence, particularly as it impacts the Church of the Living God. Um, we're going to give you all a few minutes to, to log on and get situated and get your tea and get your popcorn or whatever it is you need to get. Hey, Chiquita! Thanks for joining. Thanks for joining. If you all would share, um, and if those of you who come on regularly would periodically just put in the thing to share, that'd be great because, as you know, I'm really bad at remembering to say that, okay? Um, before we get started on today's topic, I'm going to run through a list of the topics that we have covered so far. Since we began these broadcasts, a few months ago, um, the Lord impressed upon our heart. We have a great burden for those who are ensnared in any situation that causes them to live beneath their privilege, okay, and, and causes them to forget who they are in the Lord. Hey, Kelly. Um, and so anything that <laughs> we're called to, to come against, anything that, that binds us up, anything that would... Um, mislead us regarding who we are in the Lord and what his intention is in our life and even would have us to question his character and why are we going through the things that we're going through, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, we're committed to doing that. And as you can imagine, the warfare gets quite interesting. But those of you who know me know that I don't run from a fight. I failed that class. I don't know anything about that. And so, you know, we just believe God that that the message is getting across and we understand that there's resistance to hearing it and resistance to acknowledging it but it is so prevalent beloved that it's it must be addressed it must be addressed and so we are committed to crying aloud and sparing not we're very prayerful also regarding what topics that specifically that we should discuss because it's such a pervasive issue globally here in the United States, as well as in Africa, as well as in Australia, as well as in Canada, it, globally, it is a tremendous problem. And the silence around it is deafening. And so our thought process is, you know, as we look at the things that are taking place in the world, you know, you wonder, well, why are things seemingly running out of control? You know, why are they running amok and why are people being killed off in the church and why are there mass shootings etc cetera, etc cetera. um and the reality of it is and this won't be a popular statement but we're going to say it anyway and we're not taking it back the church has fallen asleep at the wheel we've not done what we need to do we've not done what we've been charged to do we call good evil and evil good we make exceptions we look the other way um and it's time for us to cut that out it's costing people their lives and so We've been charged with raising awareness about that. And of course, that means repeatedly saying things and bringing it up and keeping it in front of folk, okay? So that prayerfully, we are moved to do something other than have, oh my God, that's horrible response when we hear a story about someone who's lost their life or a child who's been mistreated. Um, that we can do something <laughs> about it besides feel terrible about it momentarily before we go back to our own lives okay so that's what motivates us we are committed to doing this um hey there hey madeline thanks for joining please share you all know i'll probably remember to say this two more times and then it will completely slip my mind okay also if you want to partner with us we promise you this is good soil um, our cash app is Judas Roar. You can find that at the top of the broadcast. And our PayPal is paypal.me slash Judas Roar. And to roar means to make a loud noise and to be relentless about it. Okay. And that's what we are doing. Um, and we appreciate you all's support. It is absolutely, hey, Bishop Dwight Pate, it is absolutely um, appreciated when you all share and when you all partner with us. And we want you to understand that we're committed to doing this. Um, we're committed. We have no intention of shutting our mouth about this, okay? Domestic violence is killing people worldwide, okay? And some of the things that you'll hear me say almost every single broadcast is that anyone can be a victim and anyone can be an abuser, all right? So I'm going to run through a list of the topics um, that we have discussed so far, okay, in the past 
few months while we wait for other people. Hey, Jason, while we wait for other people to, to come on. So we began with several months ago, we're just doing an overview about domestic violence, right? And what it is. Um, we then did um, a broadcast around safety planning because it's critically important. And you'll often hear me say that no matter what stage you are in regarding domestic violence, whether you still love your abuser to pieces and cannot imagine leaving them, you need a safety plan. When you decide to leave, you need a safety plan. After you have gone, you need a safety plan, okay? The most dangerous time for a victim is when they are actually physically exiting the housing that they shared with the abuser. When they are physically leaving the relationship is the most dangerous time, okay? And it's during this time that first responders can become victims, their family members and support systems can become victims, okay? It's a very, very critical time. And so a safety plan is needed to navigate that safely, all right? especially if you have children or pets, okay? Um, after you leave, the most dangerous time after the actual leaving is 30 to 90 days after. And we've talked to you about how that 30 to 90 day period is relative because, for example, if your abuser was arrested, let's say law enforcement was called and they were arrested, they were incarcerated, the 30, 90 day period in on their plan, it doesn't begin until they are released. So they might spend a year in jail, but when they first get out, that's a dangerous, dangerous time for the victim, okay? So you don't wanna just look at things from your perspective. You wanna consider the thought process of the abuser, okay? So these are things that we try to mention every single time because we know that people don't always log in and they may not always catch the replay or whatever. We try to be diligent about posting them and sharing them. But, and so I'm going to run through the list so that you can understand what we've already talked about. And if any of these things pertain to you or you need to have a better understanding of them, then you can search it on our Facebook page. We have our personal page, Cheryl Richardson. We have uh, Lion of Judah Global Impact Ministries. That's our ministry, okay? We have Apostle Cheryl L. Richardson. So I try to post these things on all of our pages and so you can search them out. So we talked about trauma bonding. We've talked about safety planning. We've talked about the believer, domestic violence, and forgiveness because this is a tremendous stumbling block for many of us. We've talked about choking versus strangulation. And in talking about that, we emphasize the importance of understanding what terms you're using, what definition you're using to even define your circumstances. Because if we don't define it properly, if we utilize the enemy's definition, if we utilize the abuser's definition, the solution that we come to will not be effective, okay? So you want to make sure that you're defining things properly. So we talked about the difference between choking and strangulation. All right. We've talked about domestic violence and how it pertains to gun violence, how those two things are related. Hey, Lisa. Um, we've talked about, are you a flying monkey? Uh, one topic was I've left my abuser, but I'm a mess. Okay. Because oftentimes we have this expectation that we're going to leave and life's going to be amazing and things are going to take off from there. And sometimes... That's not what happens, okay? And so it's important that we understand that that is normal. We talked about gaslighting and hoovering, uh, domestic violence and post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. We have talked about what is coercive control. We've talked about recognizing the red flags. Um, we've talked about when domestic violence and the workplace converge. And when we talked about that, we talked about the fact that even when we have these mass shootings, that over 50% of the time, the perpetrator has a history of domestic violence, okay? Uh, we've talked about mistaking shared trauma for compatibility. Um, and this is how people can leave one abusive situation, find, wait years. They don't have to jump right back into dating. Just wait years and don't address your own trauma and you'll find yourself in another abusive situation, different face, different cologne, same devil, okay? Um, we Last week, we did a case study, Fall from Grace, when a disgraced judge murdered his wife. And we talked about the case of former Judge Lance Mason um, and when he abused and ultimately murdered his ex-wife, Aisha Fraser, okay, um, in front of their two young children. We've talked about how trauma rewires the brain. Um, and we've talked about 
what we're going to talk about today is childhood domestic violence and recognizing trauma in children. All right. So many of the, of the people that I'm friends with in real life and on Facebook and all of that, because I'm a career mental health professional, many of my friends are also clinicians or they are psychiatrists or they are doctors, social worker, therapists. You get the idea. They work in mental health. They're accustomed to working with people. And so um, for you guys, I want you to feel free to chime in and comment. Bishop Brian Keith Williams, thank you for logging on. Um, want you all to feel free to, to comment, okay? Share, undergird, help a sister out. I appreciate you being here. Um, I'd like to mention that Lisa Alexander is on, and she was one of the first broadcasts that we did, and she partnered with us. And we talked about safety planning. We did it twice. And so um, it that video went viral. It went viral. So I'm still excited about that because I think that's a key component. It's a key thing. It's something that everyone needs to know because even if you don't need it, someone around you needs it. One in four women and one in seven men have or will experience severe domestic violence in their life. So we're talking about more serious than you just calling somebody out of their name, which is not okay. But that frequency is mind-blowing it's mind-blowing okay and studies indicate studies indicate i'm trying to wake y'all hey re hey alicia um studies indicate that there's a higher incidence of domestic violence in households who claim to be christians than in non-christian households i'm gonna let that just sit right there okay there's clearly something wrong with that clearly okay and so this explains why it's so relevant and so prevalent in the church because it's not being addressed multiple reasons why it's not being addressed it might not be addressed because the leadership is guilty of it it might not be addressed because they have a history of it from childhood and and they they shy away from discussing it all right and so there are reasons why it's not discussed our point is honestly to make leadership uncomfortable not addressing it i have every intention of provoking ministry leaders other apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, deacons, church mothers, whoever. I'm focused on provoking you, <laughs> okay? Aggravating you, if I must, into doing something besides feeling badly about it momentarily and going back to your life. There are certain topics, there are certain topics that affect all of us, no matter what part of the vineyard we are convinced that we've been called to address, okay? You may think, well, I'm dealing with homeless children, or you might think I'm dealing with homeless veterans, and you might think I'm dealing with drug addicts. If you did a cross-section of any one of those demographics, you would find that domestic violence, human trafficking, drug addiction, these are all things that touch all of these areas. So to not address these things, you're undermining your own work. And so you're pouring a whole lot of work and focus into whatever. If you're an evangelist, getting people to accept Christ, leading them to Christ. But if you don't understand how to address their trauma, if you don't understand what to say and what not to say, you're undermining your own work. You're working against your own purpose. Okay. And so it's important that we come out of this myopic view that we have of this is what God has given me to do and it's the only thing that matters when there are several topics that affect every last one of us no matter what area of the vineyard we are called to okay so we've got to think more globally and stop thinking so myopically hi Pam hey woman of God Crystal Frazier Wilson all right so we're going to talk about childhood domestic violence today um, and recognizing the trauma in children. This is of particular interest to me because probably over, over half of my 30-year mental health career has been devoted to kids, children and adolescents, um, ages 5 to 17, um, specific demographics, uh, victims of human trafficking, um, victims of child abuse, victims of sexual assault. Um, and so... We've got extensive experience dealing with actual little people who have struggled with these things. Um, and we think that this is important because, honestly, we all start off as children, right? So even if we're, as an adult, have a history, it's important to be able to look back and put things in their proper perspective, all right? And so often, even if the signs of trauma are present 
in children, whether you are a teacher. I have lots of friends that are teachers. Some of you are on here now. You're a teacher, you're a nurse, you're a psychiatrist, you are a therapist, you're a social worker, um, you're in the helping professions, you volunteer at the Y or whatever it is that you do. Um, often, even if the signs of trauma are present in children, people are hesitant to get involved. Why do you think that is? If you have some ideas about why you think people hesitate to get involved, please chime in, okay? Chime in. Uh, but people hesitate to get involved. One of the primary reasons we believe that people hesitate to get involved is there's a concern about, well, what if I'm wrong? If I report this person or if I call the state or if I call child welfare, um, if I tell my supervisor, um, if you work in a facility with kids or whatever, what if they don't believe me? What if I'm wrong? Now I've ruined this person's reputation. You have put a black mark on their career. Um, we played in the sandbox together. I cannot believe they're guilty of this. There must be some other reason why this child is just so bad. Okay. And so there's a hesitancy to get involved. And we tell ourselves, well, what if I'm wrong? Here's a question. What if you're not? What if you're not wrong? What if you're not wrong? And what if you're the only person has, that has even taken the time to notice that something is not quite right? Hey, Roz, what if, you, what if you're the only one? And those of you who are therapists will know that what I'm about to say is true, right? When you have a group of people observe a thing, the larger the group that observes the thing, the less likely anybody is to do anything about it. You stand a better chance of one or two people to observe something. Because if a whole lot of people observe it, no one accepts responsibility for taking action. What we tell ourselves is, well, somebody else. Surely, there's so many people that see this. Somebody else will say something, right? Okay, so here's my challenge to you, especially if you're a believer. What is it that you're actually afraid of? Are you afraid that someone would be upset that you accuse them of something? Because then it comes down to how it's reported, okay? It's one thing to say, I observed so-and-so do something. And it's another thing to say, I have some concerns because of the behaviors that this child is displaying, okay? I have problems about the behaviors that are being displayed here, all right? So, when we hesitate, who are we protecting, okay? I submit to you that when we hesitate... Okay, when we see anything that's wrong and, and, and we hesitate to address it. Um, but today we're talking about child domestic violence, domestic violence that is observed or experienced in childhood, that we're protecting ourselves. Ultimately, we're protecting ourselves. We don't want the person that's being reported or the person who's being accused or the person that we suspect, we don't want them to be upset with us. Okay, can we just be honest about that? Is And at that point... At that point, number one, that does not reflect Christ for those of us who profess that we have a relationship with him. Number two, we're putting ourselves ahead of a potential victim. Okay, and so I just want you to think about that. When we hesitate to intervene, when we hesitate to explore further, who are we protecting? And when you peel back all the layers, it comes back to us. It comes back to us not having to deal with the consequences of maybe it being inaccurate, okay? But when you consider that you're asking that it be explored, that you're asking that it be examined, okay? You're not accusing anybody of anything. What you're saying is, these are the things that I've noticed. They appear to me to be abnormal, and I'm concerned that something else is wrong here, okay? All right? So just think about that. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind the entire time we're talking about this today. It's important to understand that 100% of the children who are exposed to domestic violence in childhood are impacted. 100%. I'm talking about those who act out. I'm talking about those who don't. 100% of the children who are exposed to domestic violence are impacted. There is no experiencing it and escaping unscathed. OK, and so we really just want to put that myth to rest because, you know, we can take a false sense of security in, 
well, they're not acting out and they seem to be fine and they're getting A's and they keep their room clean and they say yes, ma'am and, and, and no, sir. Okay. All of which could be an indication that something is terribly, terribly wrong. Hey, Christina. So childhood domestic violence is a term that's used to describe growing up with violence between parents or a parent and a significant other. Okay. CDV is a term used to describe growing up with violence between parents or a parent and significant partner. All right. And I've already stated to you that 100% of children who are exposed to this are affected by it. 100%. Hey, Barb. 100%. Okay. There's no experiencing it and not being affected by it. The same thing with growing up in, in, in a, a house that's riddled with substance abuse or addiction of any kind. There's no experiencing it and not being affected by it. The way it is um, demonstrated in an individual life may vary somewhat, but there's some very distinct um, consistency that you can just about count on behaviorally if someone has been exposed to it. All right. The other thing that I want you to remember is that we've talked about this in, in previous um, discussions, that trauma literally, physically rewires the brain. It rewires the brain. And remember we talked about how you have these three major portions of the brain and they lose volume and they lose, physically they like shrink, they lose volume, okay? And they lose their ability to regulate us emotionally. We lose the ability to discern even between past and present, which is why sometimes people who have experienced trauma may seem to overreact to something that to the rest of us may not appear to be a real threat, okay? Any resemblance to it at all is going to take them over the edge, okay? And so it's important to know that. So this is not something that people can control or pull themselves up by their bootstraps. You can't put enough oil on them. You can't cast out enough demons, okay? The brain itself... So that we know how we need to pray. When we're praying about these things, the brain itself has lost volume. And it can be restored over time, provided that the, the trauma is not ongoing. That we don't move from a situation that's traumatic into another situation that's traumatic. Into another situation that's traumatic. Which is what happens when we don't let enough time go by and allow healing to take place. Okay? from a natural standpoint. All right, so we've talked about that. The other thing that I want you to remember, and we've talked about this in previous broadcasts as well, is that children who have experienced domestic violence, who have witnessed domestic violence, hey, Annette, um, tend to go through life almost searching for the next person that's going to mistreat them. Okay? They're hypersensitive to it. And they, they're drawn to the next person that's going to mistreat them. Now, those of us who embrace Christianity um, and understand good and evil and demons versus angels and how demons can affect our lives and generational curses, we will call that a familiar spirit. We may call that a generational curse, okay? Um, but you keep in mind that, that that brain has rewired itself. And that children will go through life, even as adults, searching for the next person that is not good for them, that they expect will hurt them, okay? And it's almost like, well, I didn't like that, but I know how to do it. I know how to, I know how to function in that kind of a relationship. What I don't know how to do is to function in a relationship where I'm valued and treasured and treated like I have value, okay? Um, so let's look at the indicators of childhood domestic violence at different stages of development. Because again, it's important that we understand what we're looking at, okay? So in infants, there is a decreased responsiveness, um, increased fussiness. They might be very, very irritable. They may have trouble eating and they may have trouble sleeping, okay? And that's for babies, okay? Um, the old church mothers would say lap baby, uh, a child that's not even walking yet, okay? Um, for preschoolers, you may have increased aggression. You may have aggressive behaviors towards others. Um, frequent bedwetting. Isolating from peers. We're still talking about preschoolers now. Uh, feeling unsafe. You know, very, very anxious, very clingy. Um, suffering separation anxiety. Um, nightmares self-blame, and decreased verbal skills, okay? So 
their their ability to communicate verbally is decreased their interest in communicating verbally may decrease um and so for those of you who are on here that are teachers can attest to this that sometimes you'll have a child in the classroom and they're and they're they're incredibly aggressive or uh, they're provoking their peers all of the time and it's, it's kind of over the top and it's not normal um and usually it's an indication that something's going on at home now I'm, i can tell you this what has happened over the past 20 or so years is i believe that trauma okay has been mistaken for add attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and so kids have been put on medication when in fact that has not been the issue okay any of you that are teachers or therapists that want to chime in concerning that do feel free um so again it's important that we define things properly right or the solution that we bring to the problem doesn't address the problem and that just further stigmatizes the child or even as an adult i mean if get further stigmatized okay people don't understand what's going on with you and if whatever medication you're taking is not working it appears that you are just really a hot mess okay so again, with preschoolers, you may have an increase in aggressive behavior, aggressive behavior towards peers, um, nightmares, frequent bedwetting, um, feeling unsafe, uh, blaming themselves for everything, and decreased verbal skills. All right. Now, let's see. Grade schoolers. Okay. And some of you on here, I know you are teachers and you, and you deal with grade school kids. So grade schoolers may um, exhibit aggression, frequent outbursts, bullying others, frequent bedwetting, sounds familiar, uh, poor quality peer relationships. They may be emotionally withdrawn and isolative. They may be fearful. Um, Okay, their reactions to things that are happening in the classroom or in their life or on the playground or at recess, their, re their reaction seems to be over the top considering what has just occurred. They also may have decreased verbal skills and decreased reading levels. And so often kids are said to have, and I've been a principal at an alternative school, okay, so kids are said to, to, to have deficient verbal skills and reading skills and they're labeled to have a disability when in fact it's trauma okay when in fact it's trauma hey charles um in adolescence um you may see dating violence bullying use of drugs alcohol um early sexual activity um in our adolescence they may be emotionally withdrawn or detached uh, they may have frequent health complaints, frequent headaches, stomach aches, things that you can't really pin to a specific ailment. And maybe you, maybe they go to the doctor and the doctor can't really find anything. They may have um, anxiety, a short attention span, uh, lower verbal skills again, and difficulty trusting others. Now, let me say, let me say this. And, and I think, who oh, this is from years ago when I was a principal of an alternative school, which means that all of my kids were expelled, not suspended. They were expelled from public school. Hey, Ross, they were expelled from public school, which means that the principal at their previous school said, you are not coming back here ever again. Amen. You, you cannot come back here. And I had kids from age six through 17. All right. We had, um, we had a student, I'm not going to say her name because I cannot, but I will never forget this girl. I will never forget her. Okay. She was, I want to say she was 15 at the time. She was a, a, a big girl. You know, she, she was a big girl. She was tall and she was big. And this girl would act out every single day, at least once, but normally two or three times which required that we go hands-on. We would exhaust our verbal de-escalation skills. Um, she always responded positively to me, but if for some reason I wasn't there or I was otherwise involved with something, then it was going to be off to the races. And so it got so bad 
with us having to do restraints on her. And, you know, and all of my staff were trained to do restraints and to do them safely and to not injure, you know, the kids. And so, but there's something exhausting about having to go hands-on repeatedly with the same person two and three times a day, okay? And so we would have to put this girl in restraints. And she was a big girl. And so it would take all of my male staff, me and some other folk, to get her into a restraint safely. Um, and whenever we would restrain her, I noticed that she would, her emotional reaction would be off the charts. The way she would scream, it was just bone chilling. Bone, and I'm thinking there's something else going on here. Um, my staff got so frustrated. They were like, well, we think that she's just your favorite and she's just a bad kid. And sometimes, you know, kids are just bad. And in my spirit, I thought, we are missing something here. We are missing something. Something is wrong. Why is she acting like this? Why do we have to go through this every single day? It was exhausting. And I would have to meet with my staff after doing these restraints and, and allow them to decompress. Because it was just mentally, it was draining, all right? Um, if you care about children, you don't want to have to put your hands on them and not even because you're trying to keep them safe. It's just something that it depletes you when you have to do it. Okay. And so this went on for weeks, this went on for weeks. And then her mama was angry. Her mama came up to the school one day and she was screaming and yelling. And I remember my staff posted up outside my office and they didn't want me to be alone with this woman because they thought she might try to do something. And, and the Lord told me, tell them it's okay. And just talk to her. And so I talked to her. And I asked God, what is going on? We are missing something. And so why am I sharing this? Because rather than respond to how a child is behaving, ask yourself, where is this coming from? Why are they acting like this? It's exhausting. It's exhausting. It's not fun to be labeled bad or a problem. So what is it that they're trying to communicate and what is it that we as adults are missing? What are we missing? Okay. And so this girl, this girl, one day went up on top of the school. She went up on the roof of the school. Do you hear me? I don't know when I've been that scared. And, and I don't frighten easily. But when they called me on the walkie and said, she's on the roof. I said, she's where? She's up on the roof. And... I didn't want staff to reach in for her and her falling off or losing her footing. And I literally had to pray and ask God, show me what to do. Show me what to do. I don't want her to fall off. I don't want to traumatize her further. We've not figured out what's wrong with her, why she's behaving this way. And the only thing that dropped in my spirit is to send all of my staff back into the building. Now, my spirit man is hearing God. My humanity is thinking, this better work or we're going to have a big old problem here. And so I sent them. They looked at me like I was crazy, but I sent them back in and they stayed near the doorways or whatever. Um, and I looked up at her on that roof and I said, I have a headache and I need for you to come down right now. That's what I heard myself say. And it worked. And she came down. Because we had a relationship established prior to that, right? And so it's important if you're going to address trauma that there's some kind of a relationship, that there's some kind of foundation there previously. And she came down, not because there was a show of force and all the staff were out there, but because I said I had a headache and I needed her to come down. And she came down. And I was dumbfounded that that even worked. But I would asked God in real time. And so this is what we need to do when we're confronted with Victims of any type, ask God for guidance regarding how to address it. Because at this time, we still didn't know what was wrong with her. I just knew that I did not want her to fall off that roof and injure herself or, or end up dead. That, that was not something that I felt like we could deal with. As a school, as individuals, as professionals, that, that would have been devastating for everyone concerned. And so once she came down and I talked to her and I said, we want to help you. And I feel like we're missing something and I, I don't know what it is. And so I need for you to help me understand what is hurting you. And it turns out that she was literally being sexually abused 
every single day after school by a neighbor that her mother considered a good friend who lived directly across the street from her. So imagine that. Imagine leaving school knowing what's going to happen to you, right? Knowing that they are accepted by your family, knowing that they're right there across the street from you. You've got this visual reminder that you better not tell, okay? And it was months. And I'm, I'm telling you, my, I had staff ready to walk out, quit their jobs because they were tired of having to do restraints. We would all go home sore and achy from, from struggling with this girl. All right. And it taught me that we have to look past the behavior. We need to look past the behavior. Now, we're talking about childhood domestic violence. But, and I, but I share that story because I've often thought about that girl and wondered where she is now. And, and how she is doing. She was able to find the courage, okay? And we really, really supported her. She was able to find the courage. We called it in. We reported it. She gave all the details. The abuser was arrested. She was able to testify in court. And I pray to God that she's able to go on and have a healthy life. But my point is that if, if I had succumbed to the pressure legitimate pressure from my staff because they were getting burnt out. She was disrupting the school. I mean, it was horrible. It was, and it was every day. It was every single, every day, every day that we had school, she acted up. Okay. Um, but it's important that we look past how we're being inconvenienced or how we're being stressed out and focus on what is it that I'm missing? What is it that I'm missing? What is it that if I understood it, this behavior would not appear to be out of context, okay? Would not appear to be out of context. Hey, Lucy. All right. So, we've talked about adolescence. Now, and I've told you that trauma in children and adolescents can be mistaken for ADHD or ADD, which is why oftentimes when kids take medication, it doesn't make any difference because that's not the problem. <laughs> that's not the problem. That's not the problem. Sometimes kids have problems focusing. Um, and those of you who are teachers can attest to this. Because when they have experienced trauma, and certainly if they're currently in a situation in which the trauma is occurring on a day-to-day -day basis, um, their brain is constantly doing a threat assessment. So they're distracted. They're constantly assessing their environment. They're constantly looking for the next person that may be hurtful to them or might be a threat to them somehow, all right? And so they're preoccupied with that. It's not that they don't like school or that they don't like the teacher. Their brain is busy. Their brain is really, really busy trying to make sure that they're safe every single moment, okay? Um, okay, someone who grows up with childhood domestic violence, okay, may struggle with focus or paying attention because their brain is continuously making threat assessments. So this means that even if you were exposed to it or experienced it as a child, you may as an adult today have a difficult time focusing and staying engaged in a conversation. Your mind might wander off. You are constantly assessing your surroundings. And it may be difficult for you to focus in, even on a conversation, and, and track it from beginning to end. Okay? Um, pediatrician... Nicole Brown recently concluded a study of 65,000 U.S. children and found an overlap between attention deficit hyperactivity disorder diagnosis and a higher than normal level of poverty, divorce, violence, and family substance abuse. So her study found a high correlation between the diagnosis of ADHD and children who have experienced trauma in the areas of poverty, divorce, violence, and family substance abuse. Because all of these are traumatic events in the life of a child, okay? All right. Children who endured four or more childhood events were three times more likely to be prescribed medication for ADHD. All right? Children who endured four or more childhood events 
were three times more likely to be prescribed medication for ADHD. Okay? Now, let's talk about those instances where you go through a situation and uh, maybe you have a child experience childhood domestic violence, but they appear to be okay. The question is, are they really okay? Are they really okay? All right? All right. Sometimes they seem to be okay after leaving the abusive household. They may seem to be okay once they get into foster care, for example, or once they go to live with a family member, or once the abuser is out of the home, once maybe them and the the parent or the caretaker who has been um, the victim has left, okay, the abusive situation. But that doesn't mean that they're okay. All right. And you, you want to guard against embracing, oh, they're great and, 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 and God has brought them out and they're doing just fine and there aren't any scars. You want to not be too quick to assume that because we've already said that 100 percent of children who are exposed to domestic violence are impacted by it. And they're impacted, you know, in different degrees. It may appear at a different stage of development. It may not appear right then. Oftentimes, kids who are, are dealing with trauma, um, especially if they're with a parent who was also a victim, may keep it together. They may hold it together. They may not act out. They may not share that they're having nightmares. They may not share that they're wetting the bed or that they're having problems in school until they're convinced that the parent that was the victim is okay. All right? So it's not unusual. It's the same way the kids deal with death and, 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 and loss. If a caretaker on whom they're dependent is negatively impacted, it is not unusual for them to keep it together until they believe that their primary caretaker is on solid ground. And then you'll start to see the behaviors. This could be weeks or months later. Okay, so it's important to keep that in mind. Um, all right. They may not cry. They may not want to talk about the environment that they left. They may be concerned about being punished if they complain, if they don't appear to be grateful for being in a different environment at this time. They may be trying to protect the custodial parent. Um, from additional stress, which is what I was just saying. And then some may be hiding secrets and some may actually be coping well. So they may be, they may be coping fairly well. Okay. What I'm suggesting is that you don't assume that because you don't have any outward acting out and that you continue to pay attention, that you continue to monitor, um, that you don't push them to talk that you don't pressure them to talk. Because when we do that, right, when we do that, it's not about them. It's about us again. It's not about them being okay. It's about us being uncomfortable because we're concerned that they're not okay, all right? And anytime we approach someone who is in pain or, or has experienced trauma and our primary motivation is to relieve our own anxiety, that's not good, okay? And you run the risk of doing more damage, all right? So how can you tell? How can you tell if they're okay or not okay? Um, you can find out how your child behaves in other settings. Speak to the teacher. Speak to their friend's parents. Uh, if they're involved in sports, talk to the coach. Talk to the school. How are they getting along with their peers? How are they engaging? How are they interacting? Okay, Has their behavior changed at all? Are they more outgoing? Uh, which could be all in act. Are they more withdrawn, which could be very concerning, okay? So you don't want to just rely on your perception because you have a vested interest. If this is your child, you have a vested interest in them being healed and delivered and set free, right? So you don't want to err on the side of protecting yourself again. Um, ask other people how they're behaving. Observe them when they don't even know that you're there. Observe them playing with other kids, Um at recess, observe their interactions on the sport teams um, that they may be involved in, in the after school activities that they may be involved in. OK, so get information from other people. Don't just rely on your own, because remember now you've experienced trauma, too. If they've been if this is your child and they've been exposed to domestic violence, childhood domestic violence. This means that you were somehow 
involved. You were either the abuser or you were the victim. And that means that your brain has also been affected by the trauma, okay? Your brain has also been affected by the trauma. So what you cannot rely on is your ability to discern accurately, okay, when you have just left a situation like that. And so you want to keep that in mind and talk to people who can tell you objectively, okay, and give you specific examples about how your child is behaving. Apostle Dion, hey there. So talk to other people, okay? Um, number two. What is your child expressing non-verbally? Are they having any problem sleeping? Are they under eating? Are they over eating? Um, is their room more of a hot mess than usual? Or maybe everything is, is, is spick and span and uptight and that's unusual, okay? So you want to look at and, and, and to keep from if you have been a victim, okay, and this is you know, and you've gone through these painful experiences with them, understand that your objectivity is not to be trusted, okay? It's not. So you want to get feedback regarding how they're behaving. And this is what I say. Stick to the facts. Fact. They normally sleep eight hours a night. They're only sleeping two or three. They've done this two or three times a week for the past however many weeks. So stick to the facts, and you don't have to worry about how you're interpreting them, okay? Um... Are they having difficulty focusing? Are they having problems being still? Um, <clears throat> are they completing their schoolwork? Does the teacher have concerns about their ability to focus in the classroom? Okay. Do they startle at sudden noises? Um, do they seem particularly anxious? Do they have difficulty keeping their food down? Are they vomiting all the time? Okay. Are they laying around and not interested in interacting with their peers? Um, I can tell you that, you know, as someone who was exposed to childhood domestic violence um, extensively, extensively, um, there were things that, that I was aware of that occurred in our home that my mother, who passed away 10 years ago, doesn't even know that I know because that whole protecting them thing. There were things that she was subjected to that I did not want her to know that I was aware of because I felt like it would just traumatize her further. Um, and so there's this thing that you do where you protect, you, you protect the people that you understand have been hurt enough. And I was fiercely protective of my mother until the day that she died. And my thought process was that nobody else is going to hurt her period. And I meant that. Okay. And that comes from what I understood she had already experienced. Okay. Um, the other thing that I want to interject just from my own life is this, I have siblings that were like 10 years older, um, and their experience, well, I've spoken to one of them, um, um, and their experience was different than mine. And at least one of them doesn't have a recollection of the household being abusive or a lot of fighting or whatever, but that's because, they were so much older. It's very, very possible that someone who has abusive tendencies, of course, if it's not addressed, if it's not regulated, it gets worse over time. Okay. And so my siblings who were 10 years older were up and gone and out of the house. And that just left me and a younger sibling. Um, and, and my father with undiagnosed, untreated PTSD um, and all kinds of other issues that were just off the charts off the charts. Okay. And I was still a very small child. I was a young girl at that time. And so, um, there's no coming out of that unscathed. So for me, even today, if God has assigned someone to my voice, if I'm covering them as their apostle, if I'm covering them as their supervisor at work, if, if my job is to keep you safe, I am fierce about it. I'm fierce. I don't take any prisoners. I don't take any prisoners. I'm fierce about it. Can I help it? Okay. Because it's a part of who I am because of what I've been exposed to. And so what we have to learn how to do is to balance that out and to, and to temper it, right. And to harness it and to be able to identify, okay. Whoever I'm talking to right now, be able to identify where your Achilles heel is, be able to identify that. Okay. Um, so that you can make adjustments and take that into consideration as you navigate life. Hey, Sharon. Um, 
So what have we been talking about? We've been talking about childhood domestic violence. We've talked about how oftentimes it is mistaken for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or attention deficit disorder, which then results in a prescription for medication. Now, am I anti-medication? No, I am not. Am I an apostle in the Lord's church? I absolutely am. Do I know that medications can make a difference? They absolutely can. If a child actually does have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, all right, what the medication will do is provide them an opportunity. It will balance out the chemicals in their brain and provide them with an opportunity to make appropriate choices, okay? Um, because when they don't have that, they continue to make horrible choices, which erodes their self-esteem, erodes their self-image, erodes their self-confidence, and that does not make a healthy, normal, functioning, contributing to society in a positive manner adult, okay? That's when the diagnosis is accurate. What we are saying is oftentimes... It's not because it's trauma. It's not ADD. It's not ADHD. And so those of us who are interacting with children, I just want to encourage you to take a second look. Explore it and see, is it possible that something else is going on here? Is something wrong at home? They may admit it. They may not admit it. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we want you to consider is this. When we come face to face with any concern about some kind of an abuse or some type of mistreatment, whether it is human trafficking, whether it is child sexual assault, whether it is a domestic violence, all right, um, if we hesitate to get involved, what is that really about? What is that really about? We can say, well, what if I'm wrong? But let's take that a step further. What does it mean to you? What is the impact on you personally if you are wrong? And what is the impact on the victim if you're right and you don't follow through? Okay? What is the purpose of these broadcasts? To provoke, to make people think, and honestly, to make it difficult, to make it difficult and uncomfortable to do nothing. That's the goal. That's the goal. If we can get you to think about what's going on around you and think about your role and think about what an appropriate response is, okay? And consider this. Consider this. One of the things that, that God has, has really brought home to me, personally, I'm talking about me now, personally, is that no matter what my fear may be on a personal OK, no matter what my anxiety might be, what I don't have a right to do, what he has not given me the authority to do, even as an apostle in the church, is to know that someone is in danger, to know that someone is suffering and do nothing and do nothing. That is not OK. It is not OK. All right. And we need to be able to trust God to keep us no matter what the backlash is. OK, if we can't trust him to keep us, no matter what the backlash is, because we've done the right thing, I question our right to get up and tell people that they need to live the way we live because either it works or it doesn't. Right. And so what I have found is absolutely there is backlash. Absolutely. There's backlash. I had people trying to trying to, you know, pull a fast one when my mother was in her last hours on Earth. And I made a public service announcement. Listen here. <laughs> Listen here. She, love, she loves you, and so I'm going to give you an opportunity to interact with her. If you lose your mind, I'm hanging up the phone. You're not going to hurt her anymore. Okay, now, did that win me any brownie points with them? No, it did not, but I wasn't really concerned about that. I was concerned about ensuring her safety. And whatever that meant for me personally, that's what it meant for me personally. Okay. And so the Lord wants us to be committed to what he has called us to do on the earth. And we cannot do it no matter what it is we're called to do. We cannot do it effectively if we make excuses that make it okay for us to do nothing. That makes it okay for us to do nothing. Hey, Apostle Charlene. So I want you to think about the fact that, that if a child experiences domestic violence in the home, even if it's only one time, which is very rare, very rare, because usually it's a cycle, right? There's no way that they're not affected. That's a traumatic experience. It impacts our brain 
physically the way that it's wired, which then impacts how we respond to other stressors going forward. I want you to remember that children often will seek the next person that's going to hurt them when they have trauma in their history because the expectation is someone else is going to hurt me. That's the expectation. Someone else is going to hurt me. Okay? And we carry that into adulthood. We carry that into adulthood with us. Okay? And this is how you can move from one abusive situation to another abusive situation. And they can appear on the surface to be quite different. Right? Right? They can appear to be quite different. And then you get into it and it's like, this is the same thing. This is that same demon. This is that same spirit. This is that same devil. Okay. Um, and it's because you are now hypersensitive to that and you are drawn to that. All right. Now, I want to encourage you. That sounds very bleak and it sounds very dire. But I'm telling you, there is nothing too hard for God. But what we have to understand is how our brains are wired, how they work. All right. Um, and I believe that God is really blessing because he's got a lot of there are a lot of studies and things that are going on now that don't refute scripture. I mean, it makes perfect sense from a scriptural standpoint, even. But it's important that we understand how these things work so that we can bring the right solution to the challenge. OK, so again, childhood domestic violence is a term that's used to define a situation in which a child has observed or been exposed to violence between parents or between a parent and a significant other, okay? It can be a caretaker and a significant other if the child doesn't live with a parent, if they live with an older sibling or they live with a cousin or an aunt or an uncle. Um, if that situation is infused with violence, then they are affected. 100% of children who are exposed to domestic violence are impacted, 100%, okay? 100%. And we just have to know what to look for. So how do you address it? Don't push them to talk. Don't for That's more trauma. Don't force them to talk. Ask them. Maybe they're not comfortable talking to you. Okay. And so, so watch this now. Watch. If they're not comfortable talking to you, don't take it personal. It's not a personal affront. Okay. Maybe you thought you had this close relationship and you had this amazing bond with them. Hey, Dr. Jen, you had this amazing bond with them, but they're not talking to you. So now your feelings are hurt. Okay. Again, it can't be about us. It can't be about us. All right. If you're keeping them first, it's what do they need in order to be able to share this in an environment in which they feel safe? Ask them, is there someone that they feel comfortable talking to? Is there someone that they do trust? Okay. And find out who that is, if there is such a person. Maybe it's the counselor at school. Maybe it is someone at the church. Maybe it's someone who's not even a therapist, okay? Maybe they're not a therapist, okay? But they feel like they can talk to this person, all right? And maybe lay some ground rules that whatever they share, maybe the other person can share for them until they feel more comfortable talking. But you don't want to force them to talk. And you don't want to come off like, well, I can't help you if you don't talk to me. And you've always been able to talk to me. And why aren't you talking to me? And maybe they're trying to protect you. Maybe the answer to the question would be devastating to you. And they know that. Maybe that's the issue. Okay. So I want you to just take all of this into consideration. Okay. Understand that it's not something that cannot be addressed. It's not something that we cannot heal from. Um, but it needs to be addressed appropriately. And more than anything else, I want you to consider if you have misgivings about the way a child is behaving, um, if they're displaying any of these behaviors, if they are bullying, if they whatever it is that they're doing, they're withdrawn, they're 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 over animated they they have poor boundaries they are overeating or they're under eating whatever it is they're irritable they're crying all the time they don't want to play with other kids okay or they appear to be rebellious it looks like rebellion in teenagers a lot they they're rebellious or they're angry and disrespectful where is that coming from what happened something happened something happened don't take it personal if they don't want to talk to you if you observe this in someone else's child, okay, you need to say something. 
You need to say something. And if you're concerned that they're responding to something that's happening in the home, the parent is not the one you need to say something to because that could cause backlash on that child. Okay, so you want to use wisdom. You want to use wisdom um, and make a sound decision, okay? You want to be able to look back and say, I did what I really believe was needed. Um, my sole motivation is to make sure that this child is safe, to make sure that this child is safe, okay? All right, so we thank you all for joining us. We come on every week on Saturday um, to talk about different topics as it pertains to domestic violence. We are committed to crying aloud and sparing not. It's a mandate that the Lord has given us. Um, we are determined to, to keep this in the forefront and honestly to make it hard for you to ignore it, um, to provoke you into doing something, to provoke you into taking an extra few seconds and considering what's going on around you. One in four women and one in seven men have or will experience serious domestic violence like choking, punching, hitting um, in their lifetime, okay? And so it's so prevalent. And studies indicate that it's more prevalent in homes that declare that they're Christian than in not, okay? So if you are a ministry leader, I encourage you to please address this across your pulpit, all right? So you can do it right after you address five ways to get a blessing or whatever. We have all these series that we do and nobody wants to talk about the things that we need to talk about. OK, so let us address the issues that are trying to paralyze the church of God worldwide. The United Nations said in 2017, they issued a report and in it they stated that the most dangerous place, the deadliest place for a woman worldwide is in her own home. Worldwide, it's in her own home. OK, so keep that in mind. Uh, we covered your prayers. Uh, we are accepting ministry um, engagements to raise domestic violence awareness globally. Um, and we thank God for that. But we do cover your prayers. If you want to partner with us, it is greatly appreciated. One of the things that we will not do is be a burden to whoever needs us to come speak, who needs us to come address coach, counsel or whatever. We are determined not to be a burden to those who need us. We are determined not to draw up a contract where you have to pay us X thousands of dollars and we need this much in advance. We're not doing that. We're not going to do it. We've never done it. Okay, we're not new to ministry. We've never done that and we're not going to do it. Okay, that's our commitment to you. And so that means that as the Lord moves on your heart to share with us, it is greatly appreciated because we are determined to do what he's asked us to do. And we're determined not to hurt the people that we've been sent to help. All right. And so this is Apostle Cheryl L. Richardson. Um, we want you to follow us on our, our, we have Instagram, we have Pinterest, we've got three different Facebook accounts. We do have a closed Facebook group that is faith-based. It's called Dominion Over Domestic Violence. Feel free to, um, to join us there. If you are in the helping professions, if you are a ministry leader and you have a history of domestic violence in childhood or even as an adult and you want some uh, um, additional support and encouragement and to know that you're not alone, it's a place where you can safely be transparent. Uh, we have very strict group rules. And those of you who know me know I don't, I don't play. I love you, okay, and sit you outside the door all at the same time, all right? Love you, though. But we're not going to hurt each other in there. We love on each other and encourage one another in there. And we speak the truth and love in there, okay? And so it's called Dominion Over Domestic Violence. And I've also said in the past that if you are a ministry leader and you join the group and you determine, hmm, I thought I was healed, but apparently I'm not, and I need some support myself, that's, that's, all, that's all well and good, okay? That's what we're here for. And so we felt that it was important to keep the group small, um, we don't want the group to grow to thousands and thousands. It's too difficult to ensure the safety of the environment that way. Uh, we don't want abusers slipping in there. Um, and if it gets too big, it's too difficult to manage. So we want to be able to manage it responsibly. We want to make sure that it's a safe place for those who need it. Um, and we encourage those of you who have joined to, to chime in and share your story, encourage others, okay? Um, because we all need each other. We love you. We will be back on next week. 
Um, and you can look for the flyer later this week and you'll know what the topic is coming forward. Okay. Again, this is Apostle Cheryl L. Richardson and we appreciate you joining us on today. Please share this broadcast, partner with us if you're able to, and we covet your prayers. Blessings to you.